So, Ben, if I told you in 2020 that Joe Biden was going to approve an $8 billion plan to extract 600 million barrels of oil from the Arctic, would you have believed me? No, (laughs) I would not have. (laughs) I would have said Joe Biden, the candidate who on the campaign trail vowed to stop drilling at all on public land, Not that Joe Biden. No way. I called up Politico's Ben LaFave because I wanted him to walk me through the president's decision earlier this month to let ConocoPhillips, Alaska's largest crude oil producer, go ahead and produce more oil in a remote part of the Arctic known to be home to polar bears, caribou, and migratory birds. This effort is known as the Willow Project, and it was first rubber-stamped by Donald Trump. The problem was that it was approved so hastily, courts would not allow drilling to move forward. Once the Biden administration came in, the administration had to decide, are we going to defend this permit or not? At first, environmentalists were optimistic that Biden would shut the whole thing down. After all, when he was campaigning and he was asked about projects like Willow, He sounded like this. Hi, how are you tonight? Thank you so much for being here. Um, Just a quick question about how you feel about drilling in the Arctic Refuge. Totally opposed to it. Completely, totally opposed to it. It wasn't just that Biden had a firm answer here. He was strident about it. Remember the great oil spill that occurred? And I watched when I went up there and I went up in a helicopter up on the North Slope and saw what was going on and saw what was happening as the glaciers began to melt and how the caribou and everyone, were, I mean, there's a lot going on up there. And it's a So when Ben got word that Biden was giving his seal of approval to Willow, he wanted to ask, will the real Joe Biden please stand up? You know, some candidates may have said we're not going to do any more leases. Like, if you have permits to drill, you can use them. But he was saying no drilling at all anywhere uh, on public land. Yeah, he literally said no more drilling, period, period, period. Yeah. <laughs> yep. And uh, and here we are three years later, and he just approved this huge project. Today on the show, Joe Biden promised to wean the country off of fossil fuels and keep oil producers off federal land. What led him to change his mind? And just how bad is this going to be for the rest of us? I'm Mary Harris. You're listening to What Next. Stick around. This podcast is brought to you by Progressive Insurance. Most of you hearing my voice right now are probably multitasking. Yep, even while you're listening, you are probably driving, cleaning, exercising, maybe grocery shopping. But if you're not in some kind of moving vehicle, there is something else you could be doing right now. Getting an auto quote from Progressive Insurance. It's easy and you can save money by doing it right from your phone. Drivers who save by switching to Progressive save nearly $700 on average And auto customers qualify for an average of seven discounts. Discounts for having multiple vehicles on your policy, being a homeowner, and more. So just like your favorite podcast, Progressive will be with you 24-7, 365 days a year. So you're protected no matter what. Multitask right now. Quote your car insurance at Progressive.com to join over 29 million drivers who trust Progressive. Progressive Casualty Insurance Company and Affiliates. National average 12-month savings of $698 by new customers surveyed who saved with Progressive between June 2021 and May 2022. Potential savings will vary. Discounts are not available in all states and situations. This podcast is brought to you by Progressive Insurance. Most of you listening right now are probably multitasking. Yep. When you're listening, you're probably also driving, cleaning, exercising, or maybe even grocery shopping. But if you're not in some kind of moving vehicle, there's something you can be doing right now. Getting an auto quote from Progressive Insurance. It's easy and you could save money by doing it right now from your phone. Drivers who save by switching to Progressive save nearly $700 on average. And auto customers qualify for an average of seven discounts. Discounts for having multiple vehicles on your policy, being a homeowner, and more. 
So just like your favorite podcast, Progressive will be with you 24-7, 365 days a year, so you're protected no matter what. Multitask right now. Quote your car insurance at Progressive.com to join the over 29 million drivers who trust Progressive. Progressive Casualty Insurance Company and Affiliates. National average 12-month savings of $698 by new customers surveyed who saved with Progressive between June 2021 and May 2022. Potential savings will vary. Discounts not available in all states and situations. Can you give me a little bit of the history of the Willow Project? Because Canoco Phillips has been exploring this region in Alaska for a while now, right? Yeah, correct. Alaska, I mean, before the uh, fracking boom of the mid-aughts, uh, way back then, Alaska was a major player in U.S. oil and gas development. And you had all the major oil companies up there. You had Exxon was exploring, Shell was up there, BP was up there, ConocoPhillips was exploring. And there's a section of Alaska uh, the, on the North Slope called the National Petroleum Reserve hyphen Alaska, uh, which was set aside by the Harding administration. If you want to give our shout out to Warren G. Harding. <laughs> We're talking like 1923 right now. Yeah. Yep. And it was set aside as federal land. It was originally supposed to be where they could store oil for the Navy for when ships were passing and they needed to refuel. Um, but over the years, you know, the, the government would say periodically, we will put out leases on this land. If anyone's interested, you know, you can bid on them. So over the years, companies were up there. But then lo and behold, you had this big fracking boom in the lower 48. It's much cheaper and easier to frack a few wells over in West Texas than it is to set up shop in the frozen tundras of Alaska. So companies one by one stopped really caring about Alaska. And was there also a kind of PR reason to leave Alaska? Like the idea that you would spill oil and impact the environment? Yeah, exactly. So there was kind of like the cost analyst benefit. It's like, well, we might not find anything. If we do find something, it's going to be expensive to do. And if we spill anything or even just drilling there, you know, environmental groups are have become much more vocal about protesting or wanting to protect the Alaska wilderness. So again, it becomes a cost benefit analysis. Like, well, is it is, is this juice worth the squeeze? And the answer increasingly was absolutely not. Let's get, let's get out of here. So why was the equation different for ConocoPhillips? I think ConocoPhillips thought, you know, there is some sort of value to being like one of the only ones up there. So Conoco said, OK, we want to do five drilling sites. We want to do a helicopter pad. We want to do a, a gravel roads to connect everything, which means we have to open up a gravel mine. You know, we want to we have to have pipelines that connect it to everything. There's a lot here. Yes. Yes. I mean, it's a big project. They have to build it from scratch. Right. So the Trump administration basically says, OK, sounds good to us. And then over the course of the next several years with the Biden administration, there has to be this decision now of, well, ConocoPhillips, to a certain extent, has done everything that we've asked them to do or that the government has asked them to do as far as getting their permit application in order. Um, they have the leases. We can't tell them no uh, without getting probably sued. You know, we're hearing from environmental groups that they definitely don't want to see this project done. And we're hearing from Murkowski that she wants this project because of the, the jobs it'll bring. There's this sense that for me anyway, the Biden administration was caught in a classic political damned if you do, damned if you don't situation. I want to be really explicit. Like the concerns about drilling in this region are twofold. There's the concern about disrupting natural lands and the fact that, you know, there's polar bears here and birds. And then there's the idea that you're extracting more fossil fuel and that will add to global warming. So there are two things going on. And both of them have a lot of people who are <laughs> energized behind them, you mm -hmm. know? Yeah. It's interesting that Willow has gone up to the status of Keystone XL or like the Mountain Valley Pipeline, like some of these uh, projects, fossil fuel projects that really get into the public consciousness. And I think part of that is because of where it is. It is in Alaska. It's in like near the Arctic. The environmental impact statement that the administration had to do say like this will impact, you know, caribou herds. This will impact polar bears. Um, Conoco Phillips, you know, had a leak at its uh, natural gas drilling uh, sites not too long ago in the same area. And as you mentioned, there is the big concern that, you know, hey, didn't uh, your administration pledge to bring down greenhouse gas emissions by 50 percent by 2030? And now you're permitting this project that 
you know, the oil companies always like to say this will be the cleanest oil around. But the cleanest oil around, to a certain extent, is like, what flavor of do you like in your cigarettes? <laughs> it's still like going to be, you know, it's, it's still going to be uh, carbon emissions coming out of here, both at the drill site and, you know, eventually out of people's gasoline tanks. So let's talk about how Biden got to yes on this drilling project. I know that you've mentioned Senator Lisa Murkowski and how important she was here. Can you just explain how and why? Like, how did she set herself up to get this project through? She was constantly bringing this project up as something that, you know, she wanted to see done. Alaska's oil and gas industry, which the state really depends on. I mean, the state has really tied itself to this industry. Is this basically a jobs thing for her? It totally is. I mean, you have to understand with Murkowski, I mean, she she's not a typical, I guess, modern day Republican. She's not a culture warrior. She's seen as someone who's sincere in what she's looking for. She doesn't play games per se, like, you know, a Senator Ted Cruz or somebody. If she says she's going to do something, you know, she'll do something. If she says, if you approve this oil project that I, I need for jobs in my state, I will approve your nominations. I will uh, negotiate in honest efforts with, you know, Build Back Better or whatever, you know, legislation you may want to deal with. She's not seen as someone who's who's playing games. And Alaska is so tied to the oil and gas industry to a certain extent, trying to cut that out and going to salmon and tourism isn't going to pay all the bills. So she has to have something like this. What are some of the things that she did for the Biden administration? She did not go in lockstep with other Republicans to vote against uh, Biden nominations in, in the committee. She's voted with him on, uh, you know, certain big name legislation. I mean, her thing was, I think we had an article that quoted her. It's like, they wanted more money for EVs in, in that legislation. And I said, fine, we'll put more money for EVs in that legislation as long as we get, you know, EV ferries for Alaska, which they did. <laughs> so she's someone who's seen as that the administration can work with. I was told when the administration was, uh, when the Biden administration was getting ready to come into office, a former aide to Murkowski told me, she'll say, you know, here's three priorities I have. You got to give me at least one, probably two. Hmm. And Murkowski was like having a victory lap after the Biden administration announced this was going to go through, right? Yeah. Like literally hosted a phone call where she was like, let's party. Yeah, yeah, exactly. (laughs) I mean, she, I mean, for her, this is a vindication that, look, I did work with the administration. You have other Republicans saying, you know, no, never, you know, over our dead bodies will we vote for any anything coming from Joe Biden. I mean, she was often the lone Republican on the uh, Energy and uh, Natural Resources Committee who would vote to approve a Biden nomination. Hmm. And, you know, this is one of those things you do to show your constituency back at home. I'm working for you and I get results. But it's also, I think, a way and I don't know if she meant it at this, but for me, it was also a showing to other Republicans, look, you too can get bright, shiny objects if you play ball on occasion uh, with the administration. Yeah. OK, so I get the political reasons why Biden would shift his mind here. But even Murkowski has said the thing that she thought was a turning point for Biden was the legal argument here. Can you explain why there was a legal argument in favor of having this go forward? Yeah. ConocoPhillips had these oil and gas development leases for that section of uh, of Alaska for decades. And then once you have those leases, you can explore, you know, you can develop. Uh, but to, once you want to do, a, you know, actually do a project, you have to tell the administration, we think there's reason to believe there's major oil reserves here. We need these permits to build things on federal land. And then the government has to go do an environmental review uh, and come back and say, either, okay, you can do your project or offer alternatives and say, you can do your project, but you've got to change X, Y, Z. And if you change X, Y, Z, we'll we'll give you the permit. So Conoco had those leases. So they they had the legal opportunity to say, we want to build a project here. So that's, I think, what the Biden administration was afraid of, that the Conoco Phillips would come back and say, if you look at your own paperwork, you know, there's no reason we can't do this. Hmm. And they were worried that this kind of lawsuit could cost five billion dollars. So it wouldn't have been like a little undertaking. Yeah, I don't know about that. I mean, I'm not a lawyer. I mean, I I know 
they they were going to get sued no matter what decision they made. Mm. I think it's interesting that they picked, if we're going to get sued, we'd rather have the environmental group sue us instead of ConocoPhillips. And this is just my speculation. I think they thought if we come out against Conoco, we're going to get sued by Conoco and we're going to piss off Murkowski. If we try to shrink the project, and that's the alternative they gave Conoco, they said just do, instead of five drill sites, do three, we'll get sued by the environmental groups, but you know what? Where else are they really going to go? Hmm. So if there was any political you know, calculations in there, that's, that's how I thought they would have been done. After the break, how the Biden administration is trying to soften the blow with environmental groups and why Alaska's first indigenous congresswoman is supporting the Willow Project. Hi, I'm Maddie Stone. I'm an environmental scientist, a journalist, and the host of the Future Tense Fiction podcast, produced by Slate, Arizona State University, and New America. I spend a lot of time thinking about the future. And while I'm naturally an optimist, between the ravages of climate change, future pandemics, and artificial intelligence making us all obsolete, I know there's plenty to worry about. Fortunately, I also know that humans have a superpower that can help steer us away from some of the more dystopian outcomes for our future, our imagination. Storytelling is the playground where we can explore different possible futures, utopian, dystopian, and somewhere in between, and create an emotional connection that will help guide us toward a better tomorrow. Each month, Future Tense Fiction will bring you a story that hopes to do just that, read by an actor and followed by a conversation with its author. And while the stories are as diverse as their writers, they all have one thing in common. They explore how tech that's emerging today could dramatically reshape tomorrow. This season, you'll hear from thought-provoking authors like Justina Ireland about the relationship between a military robot and the soldiers it's meant to replace. I don't think necessarily we can program a robot to inspire loyalty when we can't even do that well consistently ourselves. And from Annalie Niewitz about the complex world of health surveillance. Robot got lucky because Robot had one of the few programmers out there who was like, you know, I'm aware that there aren't just like middle class and rich white people using this device. Plus David Iserson, who will tell us about love, fate, and life in a simulation. I think it's just that when you are offering people the opportunity to know the truth, the truth is not always appealing, and that is outside of her control. Along the way, we'll also cover AI, climate change, gig work, and even haunted houses. And we'll discuss how science fiction can help us imagine better futures. Future Tense Fiction will be available in March anywhere you listen to podcasts. Follow the show so you never miss an episode. See you in the future. Our nation has a love-hate relationship with argument. A lot of us love to argue, but even more of us hate the result. Our politics seem stuck in the mud, and many of our self-appointed thought leaders are reducing the great debates of our time to shouting matches. And it's not just in politics, it's art, it's culture. Thoughtful discussion is missing almost everywhere in our lives. But you'll find it on Hear Me Out, Slate's new podcast, I'm your host, Celeste Headley. Each week, we'll bring you an insightful guest with a challenging point of view and engage them in an honest, good-faith dialogue without partisan cliches. It's human life. If it's that important to you, you have to put your money where your mouth is. Often, the police don't do anything to resolve the questions that you call them for, and yet we are taught that the police are the only people we can call. Everything that Ben Shapiro is going to say is not necessarily good, but the best way to prove that a bad idea is bad is not by refusing to talk about it. We'll talk, we'll listen, and we'll ask the hard questions that bring out the best answers from all sides on issues that matter to the world and to you. That's every Tuesday on Slate's Hear Me Out with me, Celeste Headley. Starting on March 21st, join us wherever you listen.
in announcing this drilling project, the Biden administration did attempt to kind of soften the blow for environmentalists. Can you explain how? Yeah. Uh, Conoco's original proposal was five drilling sites with a lot more infrastructure that would have needed to be built. Uh, the administration said you got to close it down to three drilling sites. They made a lot of uh, hay in their press releases saying it brings the project down to 40 percent of what Conoco originally proposed. And they also threw in a bunch of sweeteners. And this is also kind of interesting because people say we had no idea that was coming. No one had discussed these proposals with us. And the proposals were basically we're going to close the barn door after Willow is out. We're not going to allow any more drilling proposals on acres. I think it was like 16 million acres huh. uh, onshore Alaska and uh, in the Bering Sea. So ConocoPhillips, you're the last ones here. Yes, like, exactly. Good luck. Exactly. Um, Which, to a certain extent, you know, the administration is free to do because that was the last major oil and gas project to be proposed, not only in Alaska, but in the U.S. I mean, the oil companies aren't doing mega projects really anymore. So was it really a sweetener at all? Or it was just kind of like, we can say this, too. Yeah, exactly. That's the kind of question... uh... (laughs) The administration uh, hasn't really answered. Uh, when I talk to environmental groups, they're happy to have it. But they said, even if we get this, we still don't, you know, we this isn't the prize. The prize is we don't want Willow to go forward at all. So kind of thanks for this, but it's not what we really asked for. Though we're glad to have it, I guess. Yeah, I was going to ask, like, when this proposal came out, how did environmental activists respond? Like, were they placated by what Biden proposed? Sounds like no. No, I asked other groups. I mean, I asked groups in the lead up to this, uh, what if they shrink it? And the groups would tell me, all of them would say, we don't want, we, we don't want this. Even, even a shrunken project allows Conoco a doorway to kind of expand it over the years. So there's, there's this feeling of just by getting the infrastructure in the ground, you know, the die is cast, this project may get bigger. Hmm. One of the things that was interesting to me about the approval of this project is that one of its key supporters was Mary Paltola, the first indigenous Alaskan to be elected to Congress and a Democrat. Can you explain her stance on this drilling project? Yeah. Again, I think this comes down to how tied that state is to oil and gas development. It it really is a jobs thing for them. And I think that's where Patola was coming in. I mean, remember the Alaska budget. I mean, I can't remember how much off the top of my head, but a major percent of the Alaska budget is oil and gas tax revenue. They have that fund, I think, still where um, people in the state get checks, basically royalty checks taken out of the, what was it called? The Alaska State Fund. That's, you know, again, like they, they're basically getting direct payments for oil and gas development in their state. And it's caused a big problem because when times were good, I mean, and I think when there was less focus in the general population about the dangers of oil and gas drilling for the environment, I think people were okay with that. But as soon as the business went south and there wasn't really anything else in the economy to take its place, I think it's seen as like, if we don't have this, our economy is going to flatline even more than it may have already uh, have. You know, she's obviously a member of a native tribe up there, but the native tribes up in Alaska have been a little bit more split on this project than other projects I've seen. One thing that kind of struck me was, as, as the fight over Willow got more intense, I was getting more press releases from certain PR groups really touting the voices of, of tribes in the area who wanted Willow. So do we know what the potential impact of a project like this will be, both environmentally in Alaska, but also on emissions? Yeah, there's the wildlife impact. I mean, you're basically putting this big uh, infrastructure project smack dab in the middle of the NPRA. Uh, you have to worry about animal migration, how that's going to impact things when you got trucks you know, going in and out of the area, more people living in the area. The emissions impact, according to the Interior Department's environmental review of it, they said at the, at the current scale, I think it was like 260 million tons of greenhouse gas will be coming out of that project. Oh, that seems like a, a lot. It's a lot. Um, The EPA has this kind of uh, fun, uh, to a certain extent, uh, web page. You put in the estimated greenhouse gas emissions into this little little box, and you can divide it up whether you know whether it's going to be methane or nitrous oxide or whatever. But there's also a box that you put in just for carbon dioxide equivalent. And does it tell you how screwed you are? (laughs) Yeah, exactly. And it'll give you 
like a page of equivalencies. Uh, if you give me a second, I can actually bring that page up real quickly. And, yeah, uh, sure. Give go you for some, it. Yeah, yeah, give me one second. Um, here we go. The EPA Greenhouse Gas Equivalency Calculator. Let's make this existential crisis into a game. <laughs> yeah. Press convert data. So 260 million tons. So remember, this is over 30 years would be um, 287.6 billion pounds of coal burned. Um Oof. 1.4 million rail rail cars worth of coal burned, uh, 70 coal fired power plants uh, in one year. There's a, there's a weird one. Um, 31.6 trillion smartphones charged. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> uh, yeah, the equivalent you to to get rid of the carbon uh, emitted by this, you would need to plant 307 million acres of trees. I have heard from some that part of the argument against a project like this is that by the time it comes online, we will be well on our way towards using a ton more solar, a ton more wind. And so it's sort of like going to be the late comer to the party, like, hey, guys, want some oil? And you're like, no, not really. Yeah, there's 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 that. I mean, and that would be I mean. One of the things is you probably know about living in D.C. and covering D.C. is everyone kind of thinks D.C. is the master of the universe and stuff like this. If, <laughs> if the Biden administration says this is a go, this is a go, and it's going to be there for 30 years pumping out oil. But having been around a little bit in other, in other beats, the market eventually decides. I mean, the market, you know, we're seeing EVs kind of hit an inflection point. We're seeing places like Texas, you know, wind and solar accounting for like 40 percent of their electricity generation recently. There is the question of like, are we really going to need oil and gas for 30 more years? And I think that's the that could happen to ConocoPhillips where they build this project. You know, they, they throw this party and the market doesn't show up. So that hmm. especially because where this oil would go uh, for the most of it would be to the West Coast, which is pretty heavily regulating gas powered vehicles. Exactly. Exactly. So you have California saying, hey, we're phasing out, you know, in internal combustible engines, you know, the, the sales of new cars with internal combustible engines. You know, I don't see Washington State and, um, you know, Oregon being major, you know, I, I don't see them lagging too far behind in this. So it becomes a question of where is this oil going to go? Uh, it could, I guess you could you could see a situation where they export more of it. But the plan right now is to send it to the West Coast, which seems to be saying, hey, in 10 years, we might not need so much of this. I didn't expect our conversation to <laughs> lead to this hopeful note. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you know, there's there's some of that still out there. I think David Wallace Wells, writing the New York Times, had a kind of interesting take on this project, which was that the project alone wouldn't destroy the environment. But the fact that it was approved speaks to a kind of lack of discipline when it comes to climate change and the Biden administration. Would you agree with that? Yeah. I mean, this one project, yes. Uh, it would show, OK, you're you know, you're doing something you're basically pledged you wouldn't do. What the administration will say is you have to take it all together. Like, look at the bipartisan infrastructure bill. Look at the Inflation Reduction Act. I mean, those two things together put in billions of dollars for next generation energy projects. So if you look at Willow as being almost a political necessity, but almost, I, I think to a certain extent, it's, it's the last of its kind. So they can say, we wanted to approve it for political means, and there's nothing like this, you know, coming up anytime soon on our on our radar. So let this one go and concentrate on the areas. Like, try to make this project obsolete is what I think what they're saying. It's like, we are going to make this obsolete, and therefore, it's not something we would have wanted to do in a vacuum, but there were other measures we had to take into account, and that's why it got through. Ben, I'm so grateful for your perspective on this. Thanks so much for coming on the show. Thank you very much. Appreciate being here. Ben Lefebvre is Politico's energy reporter. And that's the show. If you're a fan of what we're doing here at What Next, the best way to show us some love is to go on over to slate.com slash whatnextplus and read all about how to join our membership program. It is known as Slate Plus, and you get all kinds of great stuff when you join, like all access to Slate.com, as well as ad-free podcasts like the one you're listening to right now. Anyway, go check it out. 
What Next is produced by Elena Schwartz, Anna Phillips, Paige Osborne, and Madeline Ducharme. We're getting a ton of support right now from Laura Spencer. We are led by Alicia Montgomery with a little help from Susan Matthews. Ben Richmond is the Senior Director of Podcast Operations here at Slate. And I'm Mary Harris. Go track me down on Twitter. I'm at Mary's Desk. I'm handing the reins off to Lizzie O'Leary and the What Next TBD crew. I'll be back in this feed on Monday. Catch you then.